gets the trees successfully tested on the ground. I was involved in a study of fusion for deep space travel. Now, that's very important because almost all the energy in the universe is produced by nuclear fusion in the stars. It's not burning gas up there. The sun is a fusion factory, if you will. And the thing about fusion, not only can you make H-bombs, which from some points of view is a neat thing to be able to do, but you can make propulsion systems. Yeah. Now, let me pause you for a second. Let me pause you, because I know you could you okay. could go for hours, Just and it's very fascinating, by the way. Stanton Freeman's our guest, if you're just joining us. Um, just, what, last year, there was this image that scientists were baffled that they saw something flying into the sun. Did you see that report? No, I didn't. It sounds interesting. Did it come out is the important question. <laughs> they saw it come out, They and they believe that they were uh, it was extracting... Uh, something from the corona you know, for energy. Huh. And, of course, it didn't melt. I was going to say, that's pretty hot territory. Uh, very hot. So it would definitely have to be made. Uh, that would be some serious heat shields. Well, yeah. And remember, one of my mantras, I have several, is that technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. Uh, you know, and you, you don't have to look very far. I used a slide rule when I started working in industry way back in the 50s. Uh, most people have never even heard of slide rules anymore. Yeah, what is that? Uh, well, it's a little device that's like a, the size of a ruler. Part of it slides back and forth, and you can do multiplication and division. Oh, yeah, and sure. And things like that. Uh-huh. You know? And everybody used it. Nobel Prize winners, uh, winners used it. Uh, it. It worked. But, uh, you know, I, for three bucks, I can buy a pocket calculator that does far more for far less. You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, it, it makes the point that and it's kind of like with weapons. Uh, you, the reason for nuclear is, you know, equals MC squared. Uh, a big bomb in 1944 was a 10-ton blockbuster. It released the energy of 10 tons of dynamite. Wow, chemical energy. Took a big B-29 to carry it. First A-bomb, 1945, released the energy of 16,000 tons of TNT. The first H-bomb fusion device in 1952 released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. That's My one goodness. stinking bomb. Mm. And then the Russians tested one that was... 50 million tons of TNT energy equivalent release. Now, now those are mind-boggling numbers when you stop to think about it. But they also give you an answer to the question, why would anybody out there care about us? They want to quarantine us, I think. <laughs> I mean, you think. Look, look at our track record. Uh, in World War II, we killed 50 million of our own kind. We destroyed, we destroyed 1,700 cities. Uh, we have since that time exploded 2,000 nuclear weapons. People are surprised at that. They think of a few, Trinity Site, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, 2,000. And so from an alien viewpoint, we're a threat to the neighborhood. And there have been a number of incidents at uh, nuclear facilities, especially I'm thinking of uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. Yeah where uh, UFO shows up and 10 Minuteman missiles went offline one after the other. Now, that can't happen, but it did. It did. I talked to the guy who was down in, in the pit, so to speak. Uh, so somebody cares. And there's a book by Robert Hastings called Nukes and UFOs. A lot of observations. Fukushima, just recently, a number of years back uh, in Japan. Well, yeah, I don't know if there are any UFOs. Did anybody see UFOs? There? Yes, they did. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you look into that. Every day. Yeah, uh, that's okay. I I, fo- I try to follow the stuff too because I'm uh, you know I'm I'm curious and but yeah that was a big report saying they saw them by and uh, said it could have been a whole lot worse and most people knew it and it and people said wow it was a miracle that uh, didn't well uh, many people believe that we uh, had some help. Well, look, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I'm not saying these guys are good guys uh, running around the neighborhood trying to help people out. On the other hand, uh, I, they seem to be, uh, what's the word, they'll, they'll take action in self-defense, but they don't seem to be bent on destroying us. Well, they know we got a valuable resource. 
<laughs> could be our resources. Who knows? Well, you know, a lot of people are surprised when I say the Earth is the densest planet in the solar system. What do you mean? Aren't they all a planet's a planet? No. Uh, a cubic foot of Earth weighs more than a cubic foot of any of the other planets. Now, what difference does it make? Hmm. That means more heavy metals. Uh, uranium is one of them, for example. Big uranium one. Uranium and osmium, stuff that uh, protect uh, things that nobody's ever heard of, but they have very special properties. So they could have been mining the resources here for a long time. Yeah. Uh, There's evidence of that, too. Know. There's evidence of that, showing that uh, it, w- it wasn't cavemen that uh, were mining that stuff. Something else was. Well, that's right. We, you know, look how little we know about our past history. I mean, there was Bishop Usher in the 17th century saying that the Earth was created in 4004 B.C. He went through a lot of begats, if you will, and that's what he <laughs> came up with. Well, he left six zeros out of there Some. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. So it, it, it's, uh, like I say, I'll be focusing on the stupid things that astronomers have said. Uh, and I debate them. I'm Seth, Dr. Seth Shostak and I, as one of the leaders of the SETI movement, debated on a radio program. And uh, I got 57% of the vote. He got 33% of the vote. And 10% said, I don't know who won. Uh, so... I, I'm on a crusade, if you will. My basic rule is have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear, and I wish the debunkers would do that. I wish they would, too, because there's too many people that do capitalize off what I call just garbage, and you know who they are. Uh, yes, yes. And our latest book, uh, Fact, Fiction, and Flying Saucers, came out in September, actually. And you can get an autograph copy from me, which you can't get from uh, Amazon. And how do we get the autograph copy from you? Well, they go to my website, uh, www.stantonfriedman.com, and it shows you how to order it. You can use PayPal. makes it easy. to get uh, f- Now, Friedman, it's folks, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, Stanton Friedman, Fried, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, and uh, get your Dot autograph com. copy. Yeah, and... Uh, I mention it only because people say, oh, I can always buy the book at Amazon. Yeah, but you don't get the autograph. No, and that's special. I got nothing against Amazon. They sell a lot of our books. They're know. terrific. And if you go to my website, you, the, the, that's the sixth book with my name on it. So uh, I don't know if there'll be any more, but who, who can predict uh, I have a feeling that there's one in the works that you've been wanting to write. So, you know, hey, I'm, I'm saying get cracking, buddy. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm thinking about it, but this Good. is my third book with Kathleen Marden, uh, who's Betty Hill's niece. Um, What's that story for our audience that may not know the Betty Hill story? Well, Betty and Barney Hill were driving along in New Hampshire way back in 1961. They saw a UFO in the sky and stayed over there and moved around, seemed to follow them a bit. It came very close. Uh, Barney got out of the car and stood there with binoculars looking at this thing. It's a big round craft with double row of windows and it could see beings behind the window and got scared and uh, they took off and they heard some strange buzzing sounds that seemed to vibrate the whole car and uh, they, they lost two hours on getting home at their home in New Hampshire they had some physical problems uh, Barney had ulcers and the doctor said you know I think you ought to see a psychiatrist and uh because his medicine wasn't doing any good, and they did. And under hypnosis, Dr. Benjamin Simon, the world's expert on what t- today we call PTSD, post-traumatic stress. That's disorder. right. Yeah, it's a big one. Then uh, he had a, he ran a hospital at 3,000 beds for shell shock, shell shock war veterans, is what they were called at the time. And under hypnosis, uh, separate sessions, uh, amnesia-induced after each session, they revealed that they'd been taken on board that darn craft and treated as specimens, a catch-and-release program. I yeah, thought. I guess so. And uh, so uh, they didn't want to go public. Betty a social, was a social worker. Barney worked for the post office, very active in civil rights. It was a mixed marriage, which was kind of unusual in New Hampshire for 1961. Oh, yeah. Uh, and first book came out only be. The story got out only because somebody broke a confidence. They heard a little talk that Betty and Barney had given and told a reporter, and he followed up on it, and they thought they were going to lose their jobs. And uh, it turns out uh, they didn't. Uh, the, the story went over very well. The first book, The Interrupted Journey, came out by John Fuller. 
And then Kathleen Martin, Betty's niece, has spent years going over all Betty's records and stuff. And we put out a book, Captured, the Betty and Barney Hill UFO Experience. Great book. Years ago. Thank you for that book. Well, well, I appreciate that. We enjoyed it. And for people to say, well, I read The Interrupted Journey. Well, this brings it up to date. Yeah. The star map work, for example, is a whole chapter on the star map work. And one of my objections to some of the attacks on UFOs, you'll hear astronomers saying the aliens would have to come from hundreds of light years away. Look how long it would take. Or from another galaxy. And I say, wait a minute. The latest data from the Kepler satellites suggests that there's between 1 and 1.6 planets per star. That means that within a mere 100 light years of us, the galaxy is 100,000 light years across, within a, a mere 100 light years of us, there are 10,000 stars, which suggests at least 10,000 planets within a mere 100 light years. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying y- you can hop over there, but look, M- Magellan took his ship took three years to go around the planet, 1523. Uh Around the world in 80 days was Jules Verne's notion. That was in the 1800s. And the space station does it every 90 minutes. And if you're, spe- if you're traveling at the speed of light, or if you're going through what some uh, scientists say that you wormhole. might be able to take a wormhole. Yeah, and the, the kicker is, uh, is it something you can do, you and I run down to the airport, let's take a quick trip to Zeta Reticuli, which seems to be the star system these guys are from? No, of course not. Uh, you know, the big 747 costs a lot of money, too. And, uh, and <laughs> Kathy and I did a book, Science Was Wrong, uh, 14 chapters. We each did seven. It's time for another one because there are a lot of smart people saying stupid things. Uh, one of the things that was said by a great astronomer back in 1903 was that if there was one thing he was sure of, man would never be able to fly any distance in a vehicle other than a balloon. That was two months before the Wright brothers' first flight. Uh, uh, the British astronomer Royal in 1956 said space travel was utter bilge. Who would spend the money? What good would it do? What we need is better equipment for astronomy. And, of course, out of the space program has come a lot of good equipment <laughs> for astronomers, you know. Oh, yeah. The Hubble and so forth. So uh, we need to realize that we're a young society on the, in the larger scheme of things. I mean, if the planet is over 4 billion years old, how much history do we know? A few thousand? You know, real history. So we need to leave room for what we don't know. Uh, every direction you look. I mean, I, I, I look at microcircuits, for example. <laughs> I think back, I did some computer work when I was working for GE, and it was in another building, and it was enormous with vacuum tubes all over the place and special air conditioning and stuff like that. I got a little computer on my desk here that would outdo the best they had back then. You know, uh, things change. And if we have learned more in the last few years, surely somebody who got started a little bit before we did. Yeah, a thousand years, a million years. <laughs> yeah, millions of years, which is probably more realistic. That movie, by the way, that I uh, was talking to you about before we went on air, it's called Arrival. And uh, it's been nominated for just uh, ridiculous amounts of awards. Let's see. I think I just read a little write-up on it here. Let's see. Where do we find it here? Arrival, eight Oscar nominations, including Best wow. Picture. So this is uh, no small deal. This is a big film, Arrival. And it's got uh, Amy Adams, Jeremy Ry- uh, Rayner, Forrest Whitaker, um, so just to name but a few here, but very well produced, and it's just it's very riveting. So definitely see that movie; you'll just it'll blow oh, you away. Oh, I will. I will. Uh, Good stuff. I I'm glad. You know, at one time, several years back, three of the top five uh, motion pictures in terms of attendance or income, whatever is more important, uh, were about UFOs. You know, Close Encounters and uh, all the rest. That wasn't contact. There, there were three of them anyway. I don't know what the number is now. But uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, our book Captured is uh, being, uh, what's the word, peddled around Hollywood. Uh, and that's why I recognize, recognize the name of Forrest Whitaker. Because yeah. He's one of the people that might be playing Barney. That would be awesome. And hopefully they consult you for the movie. Well, I hope so, uh, since I'm one of the authors of the movie. But uh, 
the point is 